Hi everybody, Ninja Mama here. Tonight I want to do a video that I've been trying to do for a long time now. Um, this is on boundaries after a pathological relationship. This is the book that's written by Adeline Birch and um, you might want to check it out. It's pretty good. Um, she gives a lot of helpful tips on um, examining your boundaries um, to see like what areas you can improve in. She goes through, um, but she does it like in, in a very concise manner. So it's a very easy read. It doesn't take long to get through it. I mean, the whole book is only, let's see, it's only 57 pages long. So um, you can get through it fairly quickly. But what I like about this book is that she breaks it down and gives you some really helpful checklists that you can go through to kind of test your knowledge and um, test your own boundaries and see, like, are there areas where I'm weak, where I'm letting people in, where I shouldn't. Um, I personally also believe that there are some situations where you can put up too much of a boundary and sometimes uh, you can have unhealthy boundaries in the other direction to where you're so airtight you're closing yourself off from the world and you don't want to go in that direction either. So um, she starts off just kind of talking about your your basic um, forms of abuse, going through um, at the explanation of different types of abuse, um, such as physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, financial abuse, social abuse, um, tactics that abusers use. Um, she goes through uh, personality characteristics of abusers. She doesn't go too much in depth with that, what she mainly concentrates on is um, characteristics of relationships, um, behaviors, um, ways that you deal with a person in a relationship and how they deal with you. And um, just sort of taking a look and examining that. She goes, which um, one little area I want to touch on that I think she does a very good job with is um, she talks a little bit about how people pleasers, um, she says, people pleasers believe assertiveness is harsh, setting limits is rude, and requesting that our needs be met is demanding and selfish. Some pleasers don't believe they have any rights at all. They feel guilty for expressing their needs. They consider it selfish to act in their own best interests. Guilt and the fear of abandonment are strong forces in their lives. So, um, then she goes on to say, like, in an extreme form of people pleasing, some people believe that martyrdom, self denial, and incessant caretaking are virtues to be practiced to the point of misery. This is known as being a doormat. When people are doormats, they allow others to take advantage of them. And isn't that what got us in our troublesome relationships to begin with? And that's basically, you know, what she's saying here is that people pleasing and being overly polite to the point of opening yourself up to be taken advantage of, that's when you got to stop and say, I need to strengthen my boundaries. Um, now, examples of um, boundaries, she gives like a whole list of your rights as a human being. Um, and this is a good sort of a checklist to um, examine, you know, in your own behavior um, when you're dealing with people in the relationships in your life. Um, these are your basic rights, otherwise known as boundaries. 
I have the right to my own needs and feelings and to have them be as important as anyone else's. I have the right to experience my feelings and to express them if I want to. I have the right to not be held responsible for other people's feelings. I have the right to express my opinions. I have the right to decide what my priorities are. I have the right to be independent if I want to. I have the right to decide how I spend my time. I have the right to choose how I live my life. I have the right to change myself, my behaviors, my values, my life situation, and my life. I have the right to change my mind. I have the right to make mistakes. I have the right to develop and express my talents and interests. I have the right to choose who I spend my time with. I have the right to choose who I share my body with. I have the right to be treated with dignity and respect by everyone I come into contact with. I have the right to be listened to respectfully. I have the right to ask for what I want. I have the right to say no. I have the right to set limits and boundaries. I have the right to set limits on how I will be treated by others. I have the right to walk away from relationships that I determine are not good for me, and I have the right to have my boundaries respected. You also have the right to have these basic human rights, and you have the right to stand up for them. So then she goes on, and this was the checklist that I found really helpful. I think this is a good guide. Um, there's another section, too, where she, she goes into a little more detail. But this particular list that I'm reading from next um, is like sort of a, a self-examination list. Um, if there's a relationship in your life that's troubling you, um, you may want to ask yourself these questions. These she labels as signs of weak boundaries. Ongoing anger at yourself or someone else. Feeling resentful. Low self-worth and self-esteem. Apologizing frequently. Doing things that make you uncomfortable. Doing things you really don't want to do going along with someone else's relationship agenda, going against your personal values, rights, or needs to please others, putting others' needs ahead of your own, being sexual when you really don't want to, or engaging in sexual acts that make you uncomfortable, letting someone touch you when it makes you uncomfortable, not being able to notice when someone else's behavior is inappropriate, Telling someone intimate details about your life when you've just met them. Staying in a relationship that makes you unhappy. Returning to a relationship when you know you shouldn't. Letting others direct your life. Giving as much as you can without getting as much or anything in return. Allowing someone to take as much as they can from you. Being overwhelmed and preoccupied with someone. Accepting food, drinks, or gifts that you really don't want. Committing yourself to something that you don't have the time or desire to do. Letting others decide your reality. Letting others tell you what your thoughts, emotions, and motivations are. Letting others define you. Not being able to assertively ask for what you want. Feeling responsible for other people's feelings and problems. Complaining to others instead of talking to the person who is causing a problem. Becoming easily overwhelmed emotionally. Seeking the approval of others. Inability to separate your self-worth from what you believe others think of you. Self-consciousness and social anxiety. Saying yes when you want to say no. Feeling guilty when you do say no. Saying no when you want to say yes. Not speaking up when you have something to say. Adopting someone else's ideas or beliefs so they will accept you. Not calling out someone who mistreats you. 
becoming overly involved in someone else's problems, not communicating your emotional needs in your closest relationships, avoiding difficult conversations because you're afraid of confrontation or of displeasing someone, doing things out of a sense of obligation instead of protecting your energy and time for things you're enthusiastic about, spending time with people who drain you or that you don't really like to be around, feeling you do a lot for other people but they don't appreciate it, ignoring problems or staying quiet to keep the peace. Expecting others to know what you need without telling them. Inability to be honest. Understand that having personal boundaries is okay. In fact, boundaries are absolutely necessary for emotional and physical safety, healthy relationships, and a happy life. Self-worth comes from honoring who you are and what you want. It comes from living your life as you want it, to live it not from living it the way others want you to. So I thought that was the best part of the whole book, that little self-examination checklist. How many of us here right now have done at least, I mean, there was a lot of things on this list. This list went on for three pages. Um, how many people have actually, I mean, done at least 15 of these, if not more, if not almost all of them on the list? And there's your problem right there. And it doesn't just go on in, on an individual basis, it goes on in society. And you see this all the time in societal narcissism and narcissistic organizations and narcissistic systems. Um, it happens all over the place in many different settings. Um, one of the best talks that I saw, um, if you look up anything by Pia Melody, uh, she did a lot of work on codependency, wrote books, and gave a lot of lectures on codependency. And you can find a lot of her work here on YouTube. And she gives some really great talks, and she has a good sense of humor about it, too. And um, a lot of what she talks about is basically weak boundaries. And she'll talk about how, like, you know, codependents get in these relationships with these manipulative people who abuse them. And, but she said, like, they're both broken people. Like, it's not all the manipulator's fault. And codependents themselves can manipulate to a certain extent also. Um... Like, look at that list, like how they said doing things you really don't want to do because, and the motivation for that a lot of times is you're trying to control your abuser's reaction. So you're thinking, okay, I don't really want to do this, but if I do this, this, and this the way they like it, then I won't get yelled at, or then they'll, they'll want to spend more time with me, or they will want to go to that family event that I want them to come with me to. You know, like there can be manipulation on both sides. Um, one thing she talks about too is the oversharing thing, which was a funny part of one of her lectures where she um, says, you know what I'm talking about when you're oversharing, and she says it's part of um, and codependency itself she describes as emotional immaturity because you're placing your self-worth outside yourself instead of finding your own self-worth from within your whole self-worth rests on other people's reactions to you so it's very similar to narcissism in that respect but it's opposite ends of the spectrum whereas the narcissist is trying to get a certain reaction by dominating other people or is trying to achieve some sort of supply, whether it's material or reactionary or what have you, 
the person, the codependent on the opposite end of the spectrum is just trying to be loved. You know, the codependent's looking for positive feedback. The codependent's looking for love and they think they're going to get it by caretaking, which usually ends up turning into enabling, unfortunately. Um, so she talks about um, the oversharing thing and she says, you know what I'm talking about. She says, like, the person who goes to talk to their therapist and they don't talk to their therapist about the things they should be talking to their therapist about. And then they go to the grocery store and on their way out, they tell the bag boy, I'm an incest survivor. <laughs> and I just thought, really thought that was so funny because I have been in the situation where I'm telling and realizing it while I'm doing it that I'm telling people personal things about myself to a stranger or to someone I don't know very well and I'm thinking to myself I probably shouldn't be telling this person this much about my personal life and nevertheless I'm doing it anyway and th and that's something I've definitely worked on over the last two years since I left my pathological relationship um, but that's um, a very big and it's a common example with a lot of us here in this community um, the the oversharing thing the weak very weak boundary letting people in when you shouldn't um, like in that video where I mentioned I was talking about the immigration thing and I said, you know, would you leave your house and leave your door wide open and put a sign in front of your house that said, you know, come on in, help yourself. You know, nobody in their right mind would do that. So, you know, so why would you do that with your personal life? Why would you do that with your emotional well-being? Because that's what's going on. If you're, you have weak boundaries and you're letting people have knowledge about your personal life that they really should not have your weakening that boundary that that information could end up being used against you um so that was uh that was one good example I, also too i find you know in doing that like when people overshare it's almost like you in some cases are violating your own boundaries. You're violating your own boundaries, like when you do that. Um, one place I've seen a lot of that is Facebook, um, you know, social media, and I'm sure it happens a lot, like on Twitter, people who you are on Twitter or Instagram, I've never been on those platforms and about like seven months ago, I deactivated my Facebook and I haven't been on ever since. And um, I do find that people share too much on social media, and that's a they're violating their own boundaries. That's how I see it. Like these people who go into these long paragraphs about what's been going on in their personal lives, and like I said, like people can use that against you later on. Like you don't want to put that out there so that anybody who can see your Facebook page can see that because you don't know if there's people who you're Facebook friends with who could be total narcissists and they're just gonna read your page and data mine like a narcissist does and that information could be used against you someday. So um, to keep yourself safe, it's usually better to not overshare, especially on social media. Um, and some people, you know, are really paranoid too about like, you know, government spying on people on, you know, their social media pages. And sure, they can. I mean, police departments are now using it in criminal investigations. Even when a person has their whole page set private, they can subpoena the person's social media account and read whatever they're posting on their social media. So you do have to be careful what you reveal to others. Um, I've been watching, I recently stumbled on a channel. Um, it's called um, Trump News Truth Natasha. Um, check it out, it's here on YouTube. It, it's an older channel. She's been on for, gosh, like five years. 
And she started off like talking about toxic people and toxic relationships. And that's how I found her channel because I found some videos that she had on toxic people. Um, she also, she, she sort of changed over like I think in 2015 or 26, early 2016, she kind of changed more into a political channel. And now she's just doing like news and political commentary. But if you look in her playlist section, she has a whole section on toxic um, people. And you, she's mainly talking about it from like a, a family of origin perspective. But she, she, she does talk about also like to other toxic people that she's come across in her life, like coworkers, neighbors, friends, um, relationships. So, but really like the stuff she says you could apply it to pretty much any situation. And she does a really great job. She's very well-spoken. She does a great job of explaining things and um, just talking about how her life experience has taught her to have stronger boundaries and don't let these people push you around or tell you who you are you know, or tell you what you, you're supposed to put up with and then they want to take advantage of you and walk all over you. Um, especially, you know, in a work, in a workplace situation, you know, um, but in any situation that would apply. So you might want to check out her channel, the section she's got on toxic people. That, that's another, she, I, I found her channel to be very, um, informative and I, I just enjoy, her, you know, her videos a lot um, so you might want to check that out um, she also goes into a lot about not oversharing with people especially at work in fact she is of the belief she says that you shouldn't even share at all at work like don't be friends with people you work with and don't share anything about your personal life with people at work like, she doesn't tell people she's divorced, she just says she's single and offers no explanation. And she doesn't tell people about her past, and she doesn't tell people about what happened in her marriage or anything like that. She just says she's single and that's it. And if people try to pry, she just tells them simply, I don't discuss my personal life at work. And that's a great example of asserting a boundary and but you don't have to be an asshole about it you don't have to be a rude asshole about it if you don't want to discuss your personal life with someone that's all you got to say is I don't discuss my personal life at work I don't discuss my personal life with strangers I don't discuss my personal life with people I've just met you know you have the right to assert that boundary and you know the narcissist, you, you can always pick out a narcissist because they're going to try to break through that boundary. Now, on a larger scale, um, on a more societal level, we've seen this boundary pushing going on for decades now. And to the point where, you know, there's people who are pushing for really bad things that are not good for people and that are not good for our country. And then when you point out, think of, and think about how this went in your relationship with a narcissist. When you point out their bad behavior and say, look, this is causing bad things to happen, then you're labeled as crazy or judgmental or intolerant or unchristian. And they will actually turn it around, flip it around, and use your own high moral standard against you. And it's like, you know, you have the right to have a boundary like, yes, I understand like being a judgmental person is bad, but if I see something, some bad behavior or something evil going on, I have the right to call it out and say that, hey, this is not okay. This is breaking a boundary and that's not okay with me. You know, um, like think about, okay, a perfect example is what's going on in Europe right now with the migration crisis. 
that's um, especially bad in Sweden right now. And for a long, long time, people were trying to cover it up. And now people are, there are people who are starting to speak out about it. And some very brave reporters who have gone in there and started talking to people who live there, and they're saying, um, yeah, but our government is covering it up. Our media is covering it up. They're not reporting it. And it's we're in a crisis here because they've let too many of these third world migrants in and these people are not assimilating and they're not able to get jobs in the community because a lot of them are coming in they they're coming from third world countries they have no education they have no job skills they're getting on the welfare programs and they're not used to living in this civil this type of civilized like first world society and so they're coming in with just some barbaric behavior they're attacking people in some cases violently um there's a lot of rape going on in sweden right now that their leadership does not want to talk about and the eu does not want to talk about and they're pushing like this cognitive and some of the people there are even in the state of cognitive dissonance and on an individual level remember what that was like when you were involved in your relationship, in your toxic relationship with the narcissist and they're just doing horrific things and you're calling them out on it and saying, hey, look, this is not okay. And then they go on the attack and they attack you. Stop judging me. Or you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Like when I would bring up, uh, you know, the drug usage with my ex-husband and bring up, you know, I don't like it when you do hard drugs and bring them into the house and such and, and spend ungodly amounts of money on them. And I would get told that um, I didn't know what I was talking about because I didn't do those drugs. So I didn't really understand and that he was smart enough that he was not going to get hooked on them. And for a long time, I went along with that and I believed it. I was in a state of cognitive dissonance. And that's what that is. And like, that's what's going on. If you look at that on a larger scale, that's what's going on in Europe right now. There are people who actually believe that you just have to put up with all this horrible behavior. Like some of these people, they're attacking, they're setting off bombs, they're setting fires, and they're causing a lot of harm to the communities where they're living. And the people, there are some people who actually believe that they're just, oh, well, this is their culture. They don't understand. They're not as educated as us. They're not as advanced as us. So we just have to tolerate it and be good Christians and welcome them and, and give them this nice place to live because they're coming from war ravaged countries and we, ha we have to let them stay. And in the meantime, they're getting, their cities are getting just ravaged. There comes a point where you gotta put your foot down and say no. You know, we don't mind immig immigration, but it needs to be regulated. You can't let everybody in. And they have to be not criminal, not violent. They have to have some sort of marketable skill where they can come here and earn a living and take care of their own families without being a burden to the taxpayers. And I, I believe whether you're a citizen or not, you should not expect the taxpayers to support your family, but that's my personal belief. Um, but I especially don't think people should just come here from other countries and there's no limit and they can just all come on over and then we're going to give them taxpayer funded benefits unlimited that and they're not even citizens that's just that cannot work it cannot work you're going to collapse a country like that and that's what's going on in Europe right now with the EU and that's probably a big reason why England wanted to exit the EU if you want to get into the more, you know, political, societal, narcissism kind of spectrum, I can I totally understand why they wanted to pull out because they see what's happening. It's going to collapse, you know. Um, 
And the narcissists who are in charge have designed this that way because they think by causing complete chaos and collapsing things over there that people will be easier to control. And isn't that highly narcissistic, isn't it? There are a lot of narcissists out there who, you know, the people that they abuse, their targets, they don't want them to be more educated. They don't want them to be more worldly. They don't want them to have healthy friendships outside of the relationship. They don't want them to be individuals with individual rights and individual boundaries. And it's much easier to control people when they're in that weakened state. So um, you can just see examples of people, people's boundaries being violated and like I said, people violating their own boundaries. You can see all over our world today. So um, I would recommend this book. Um, she also goes into um, about taking your time after you get out of a pathological relationship to examine which of your boundaries you need to strengthen. And even sitting down and making a list before you get involved in another, and she's mainly talking about like a romantic relationship, um, even sit down and write down, you know, I will not accept this. I will not accept that. I will only be in an intimate relationship with someone who, you know, does this and that and does not, you know, yell at me or call me a name or get mad at me if we disagree on something. Um, you know, whatever your personal list is, you sit down and actually write it out and get that squared away with yourself before you move on to another relationship. Because let me tell you, it is very common and I have seen this happen where someone gets out of a pathological relationship and the divorce papers have not even been signed yet and they're already dating someone else. And I just don't think that's healthy. I don't think that's okay because you're not taking the time to examine because you can't just pin everything that went wrong in the pathological relationship. You can't just pin it on the narcissist. Like Ross Rosenberg says, it's a dance. It's the human magnet syndrome. It takes two to make that dance work. They violated your boundaries, but you had weak boundaries and you allowed them to do that. You enabled them. So it's important um, how she describes in the book that you have to take the time to work on yourself and examine where you need to strengthen boundaries before you get back out there and start getting involved in intimate relationships with other people. Um, that's very important. That's what I've been doing for the last two years. I'm not even interested in dating yet because I want to make damn sure that the same thing doesn't happen. And like I was just saying about the people I've seen who will jump right into another relationship, that almost always ends badly. I mean, I've talked to in the last two years and it's so crazy because I keep hearing the same story over and over again about marriages breaking up where, you know, the spouse gets hooked on the opioids and goes crazy and spends all the money and then they get in huge debt. And I've even heard cases where they had their house foreclosed on, you know, and I mean, just awful, awful stories. And I've heard stories more than once where they immediately get involved with someone else and it's almost always another narcissist. And then they get themselves right back, in some cases even marry the person and then end up with a second divorce because they got into another pathological relationship because of their weak boundaries because they were just going through life like Lisa A. Romano says. She says if you're living under the veil of consciousness you're just kind of going through life on autopilot and you're not paying attention 
to what you're allowing into your life and what you should or shouldn't be allowing into your life. And that's why it's important to take the time to do the work. You're not giving yourself enough time if you've just divorced a pathological narcissist and then like within months you're dating someone else and then a year later you're engaged. Like I just, some people get lucky and maybe they do meet the ni a nice person who's not a narcissist and you know, maybe it works out. But personally, I won't take that chance until I'm sure that I've done the work and I've strengthened my boundaries to a point where I'm not going to end up in the situation I was in in my former marriage. Um, so I would highly recommend this book. Uh, definitely check it out. Here, yeah. hold it up to the camera so you can see. Um, this is it. Can you see it? I got it off of Amazon. It wasn't that expensive. And, um, it's definitely a good read. So um, the next video I'd like to do is on the, uh, the other book that I was reading, which is Psychopath Free. That one's really great by Jackson McKenzie. So I'd like to do a review on that one next. And until then, as always, thanks for listening. Good night.